Uh, if, in your Bibles, to the Word now, Colossians 3. We're in a series uh, in Colossians. And uh, where we're at in the book is what we're calling kind of a mini-series of the series about Colossians is Practical Christianity. The first two chapters, as we said throughout the last couple weeks here as we gotten into chapter 3, the first two uh, chapters are mainly theological. Uh, and in fact, some of the greatest, what we call Christology, that is, who is Jesus Christ? What's he about? Uh, and how does that, how do we think about Christ and about God? That was all in chapters 1 and 2. And now, as Paul often does in his letters, the Apostle Paul, now he's kind of showing us how does that theology play out in life. And so this is a section uh, called Practical Christianity, you might say. And so we're going to be, uh, again, digging into chapters, uh, Colossians 3. We're going to be looking at just verses 10 through 14 this morning. Let's, let's read and pray and get after it. The Word of God says this. By the way, I feel the air conditioning is kicking on. I feel it. All right, good, because it was getting a little warm in here, especially after you play the drums. All right, Colossians 3. And have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, Humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also must forgive. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Let's pray. Father, we again thank you for your word. And I thank you for its relevance in our lives. I pray now, God, that you would help us. That you'd help us, God, because these realities that we're facing, especially as today as we talk about conflict and living a God-empowered life, God, these are very practical things. These are the things that wear us out. These are the things that cause us to throw our hands up in the air. These are the things that cause... Uh, Years and years, even decades of, of, in families and in churches of just division and ill will and bitterness that resides in our hearts. This is practical stuff. God, it's so easy to skate around these things or gloss or push people aside or push them to the corners of our lives. God, help us to see that the God empowered, the Holy Spirit driven life is a life that sees people through your lens and not ours. Do that work in our hearts this morning. Help us to see the people that you put in our place as you see them. And let that change us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, again, practical Christianity. The Apostle Paul is giving us a picture into what a daily reality, a daily life, or the, 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 the walk of of a Christian. And last week we looked at a section that was uh, about putting off the old nature, putting off sin in our lives. And we asked the question is it normal for a Christian to struggle with sin routinely, on a, even on a daily, in fact, hourly basis, maybe? And we said, yes, it is. We have this old fleshly nature that is dead but kind of stinks still in our lives, right? And it, it, it's part of our lives and it, it festers up in our lives and Paul called us to kill it, to put it to death. A, a death choke on the battle with sin in our lives. And praise God for that. But isn't there something more than just this grudging Christian life of just battling with sin all the time in our lives? It can wear you out, can it? Isn't there something more? Isn't there a kind of victorious, God-empowered, Holy Spirit-filled life of purpose and passion? And there is, friends. There is. 
And yet, I want to point out to you, as we get into the text, the context of our verse here this morning. The Apostle Paul, I remind you, he's writing what appears to be a response to the things that were happening in the church. Epaphras, if you remember at the beginning, was one of the founders of of the Colossian church. And he has visited Paul, and with that visit, most likely, he's asking questions. What do I do about this? How about this? This is going on. This is happening. And Paul is writing in response. In our context of today's verses, I want to point out as we talk about the victorious Christian life and Holy Spirit-empowered living is in the context of conflict within the church. That's really what he's addressing here. It's in, within the context of the church, and within the church there's conflict and division going on. So think about this, just so you get it right. The, power, the, the, power, the God-powered life, the Holy Spirit-powered life is being brought to us within the conf, context of conflict. Now we saw last week there are some behaviors, we were in this context of conflict, and we saw some behaviors that Paul called us to put off. Just to remind you in Colossians 3, 8 and 9, uh, in particular Colossians 3, 8, it says, But now you must put away all them, anger and wrath and malice and slander and obscene talk. These are things that we're supposed to get rid of in our lives as it relates to conflict with other people, specifically within the church. Now this is, friends, the daily life, conflict. The great reality of many of the problems that we face, yes, some of them are money and immaterial things, but most of it is the problem of people, is it not? Sometimes we don't like people. We can say amen to that. Amen. Amen. (laughs) People drive us crazy sometimes. Sometimes your spouse and your kids and the people that you know best. And yet, We would also amen the reality that people are also simultaneously the greatest source of joy in our lives, are they not? And inspiration and hope. The problem of conflict is as common as eating three square meals a day. It happens, and it happens all the time. And so... Uh, often, we, the truth is, is that many of us inside the church, and if you grew up like me, we're just not good at doing conflict, are we? We just didn't learn very well. In my house, I've said this over and over, it was put up or shut up. Whoever is the loudest or the toughest wins the conflict. End of story. I love what uh, uh, this, the, Ron Craybill, he says, how to turn a disagreement into a feud. I love these you might hopefully laugh at them, but they're very true at the same time. Here's how you turn a disagreement into a feud, a little thing into a big thing. Be sure to develop and maintain a healthy fear of conflict, letting your own feeling, feelings build up so you're in an explosive frame of mind. If you, number two, if you must state your concerns, be as vague as possible. Men, you're very good at this. And as general as possible. The other person cannot do anything practical to change the situation. That's great stuff. Number three, assume you know all the facts and that you're totally right. The use of clinching the Bible verse, a clinching to a Bible verse is very helpful. Speak prophetically for truth and justice and do most of the talking. Number three. Number four, with a touch of defiance, announce your willingness to talk with anyone who wishes to discuss the problem with you, but do not take steps to initiate such conversations. Number five, latch tenaciously onto whatever evidence that you, can, that you have that shows the other person is wrong or merely is jealous of you. Number seven, I, or six, I thought these things were really funny. Uh, judge the motivation of the other party on any previous experience that showed failure or unkindness, keep track of every angry word. Number seven, if the discussion should, alas, become serious, view the issue as a win or loss struggle. Avoid possible solutions and go for total victory and unconditional surrender. Don't get too many options on the table. Number eight, and the last one, pass the buck. 
If you're about to get cornered into a solution, indicate that you are without power to settle. You need a, your partner or spouse or bank or whatever. But pass the buck. Those are, by the way, those are not good things. So <laughs> don't take that stuff home. But in all seriousness, Paul calls us into the God-driven, Holy Spirit-driven life in the context of conflict. Let me just ask you, how, what's your track record here? Is your life a series of of, uh, burned bridges and dead bodies thrown under the bus? Does God get glory in conflict in your life? And I want to drive out, I think, an even bigger, uh, uh, to me, a bigger point that, that really is showing through, I think, as we read the book of Colossians. Paul is writing to the church. Friends, I want to remind you of something that's been lost in our culture, a way of thinking about the world and reality, especially in Christian reality. God's purpose isn't really so much about you as it is about his church. Paul is concerned about the church and the testimony and the witness that the church is to a lost and divided world. So now you may see the the relevance, I think, of today. And in a world that tells us, even inside many times in the church, that tells us it's all about us. And sure, I'd love to have good conflict management skills so I can have more peace in my life. That's not necessarily wrong. But that's not really the context of why Paul is writing. Paul is writing because he wants the church, the Colossian church, Redeemer church, to be a good testimony to the world. And so this isn't about you. And we need to start thinking more corporately about our lives. You affect the body. And how you do conflict affects all of us. How I do it, in particular, probably most really matters. And friends, as as we plant churches and we ask questions and we find out why people don't don't often want to come to church or what what their hang up with church is, oftentimes we hear this thing, I got a problem with organized religion. And a lot of times those things will be about money or scandals that they see on TV. And we understand that. But let me say, most of the time, it's that people have been burned by people in the church. Or they've watched it happen. And it's so gross and ugly, they just say, I don't want anything to do with that. Friends, our testimony matters. And this is important. Not just on an individual level but on a corporate level. If we're going to radically change the culture and world that we live in, friends, let it start in the household of God. This is a polarized world. I mean, you just turn on the TV, shootings and wars and rants and raves, right? Get off of that stuff, by the way. It's just conflict, 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 not done well, mismanaged. And the church should shine Like the sun, the city on a hill, and how we deal with conflict in our lives, and then especially within the church towards our other brothers and sisters in Christ. Today, three Ps, three three put-ons, I guess. He calls us to put on three things this morning. Three put-ons revolving around the area of the the reality of conflict in our lives. Three put-ons Uh, for empowered Christian living. And these three put-ons are for seeing people through God's purposes, not as problems. That's really the heartbeat, that you would see these put-ons, that we would see in these things that he's calling us to put on, that we would see people not as problems, but as part of God's purpose in our lives. So the first one, put on, number one, a renewed mind. Put on a renewed mind. I think that's the first point. The, he says this, right, in, in verse 10. The, put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. We cannot miss this word renewed in the text, if you look at it. That the Christian life, again, is a battle, an ongoing battle, to change the way that we think, to change our minds, 
I always loved R.C. Sproul, The Renewing of the Mind was the title of his ministry. It still is. And we are being renewed by obtaining knowledge. That is, we're putting off old habits, the old ways of thinking, the old stuff of put up or shut up in my house needs to go away, and I need to put on the things that God, God's Word, and God's people uh, that I see modeled in my life put those things on. And so we can't em- emphasize it enough that this is a process that is learned. It's being renewed is a transformation. In other words, you don't become a Christian and then all of a sudden just see things the way they need to be. But this word or this reality, what he's trying to say, be renewed in the knowledge, he says, after the image of its creator. This is practical Christianity, friends, that God is changing the way that we see the world, changing the way we see people. Romans 12, 2, a very familiar verse. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. But what we're trying to change into is the image, after, after the image of our creator, the text says. In other words, we're trying to see the world as God sees it. That's what God is doing. The knowledge that we gain uh, regarding the world and reality. So it changes as we come to God and come to His Word. It changes the way we see money. It changes the way we see our jobs and our possessions. It changes the way we see events of history and shootings and wars. But most importantly, as it relates in today's context, it changes the way we see people. How do we view people? specifically in the context of conflict. The renewed knowledge is to make us more like Jesus Christ. Listen to Romans 8, 29. It says, For those He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. God saved us that we might become more and more by the renewing of our minds and the way we see things to be more like Jesus Christ. Now we're going to fall short. Nobody reaches that perfection. I think we all know and understand that. But that is the goal. That's practical, everyday Christianity. And we see that quickly, that is, this call for renewal is in the context of conflict because he mentions some divisions that were in the church. These are probably specific examples. And, and, and so we're going to see really quickly how and why this is so relevant. And so important. I pray that you see the magnitude of Paul's list of groups of people here. Because we live in a polarized world. More than ever. I mean, everybody sees that. The polarization of our world. And we... It, 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 those polarizations often spill over into the church. And they were happening in Colossians. So let's look at the list of, of people that he lists here. We're called to renew because... There was, they were seeing the groups and people in ungodly ways. He mentions Jews and Greeks. That would be what we would call in our context today racial division within the church. Now we're going to see this in a little bit, but really it's ethnic division, ethnicities. But people were dividing up inside the church based on maybe the color of their skin or what country they grew up in. And people are different, aren't they? If you go to Germany and you're five minutes late, they're very punctual people. You go to South America and you show up an hour late, you're right on time. People do things differently in different cultures. That can be annoying to us, can it? Then he mentions the circumcised and the uncircumcised. These were religious divisions. The Jews were God's people following all the rules and all the laws. And the uncircumcised, those were pagan people, probably worshiping all kinds of gods. And there was divisions within the church along these lines. Expectations of how people should perform and act within the church based on their old religious habits or lack of. Then there are barbarians and Scythians. These are uneducated people. Barbarians were uh, uneducated. You might say dumb, if that's a word I can use from the pulpit. Uh, Sorry, parents, if you can't say that word in your house. They said it here. Uh, Scythians were the most hated and feared people in all that culture. 
It says uh, one writer wrote that these men, these people were known for drinking the blood of their enemies, using their scalps as napkins, and skulls for drinking bowls. These are the kind of people that he's mentioning. These people were in the church, and they didn't know what to do with them. And there were divisions along these lives, slave and free. I think we understand that, although slavery in the Bible is, is in a different context than how we think of slavery in, uh, the, in the South. This is more of an indentured servant, but all it was still the same. The, uh, Aristotle wrote around this time that slaves were basically living tools, like a hammer or a saw that you would use as you saw needed and then put them away. And yet, here they are, friends, all together in God's church, Scythians and Jews and Greeks and slaves and free. Isn't it a beautiful picture? Don't we see how relevant this is in our worlds, in our world today? And their united bond, he tells us, is that Christ is all and in all. That is Christians. They, all these people, whether they're Jew or Greek, or barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, they were all in Christ. That is their common bond, their love, their unity was in the reality that they were all sinners. They all had their own forms of sin and idolatry. And Jesus Christ was the Savior and King of all their lives. They all knew the same love, the love of the cross that they all found. That's what tied them together. And it's a beautiful, beautiful picture, is it not? Friends, this is what I love about the church. And I pray that you love this about the church. And this is why the church is so important. In our cultural context, why this is so important. Because again, we live in a very, very, very divided world. I think about the current talk that's just daily about racism in our country. What we need to quick, quickly understand about racism is that the Bible teaches that there's really just one race. That's the human race. And that all people, what, no matter what your skin color is, are the same and equal. Isn't this, why, why don't we preach this message on national news? Wouldn't that help? God sees everybody the same and don't, don't matter. Everybody deserves dignity and love and respect. And they do. And friends, uh, so what we are talking about usually with racism is really ethnic differences. Black, white, Asian. But d divisions exist on all levels in our society, don't they? It's not just racial. I mean, in some kinds, in a joking way, it's not just ethnic kind of divisions, but we have divisions over Hawkeyes and Cyclones, right, in our houses. We see these divided signs. And sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's not. In our town, even in our church, we make people south of Highway 34, right? And then we, we, yeah, I see people turn around. This is a big joke that goes on, whether you're south of 34 or north of 34. Pro-gun or anti-gun, pro-vaccine against vaccines. These are just polarizations that are happening, divisions all through our culture. And we laugh at some, but friends, they are very serious. And what we need to do first as we, as we kind of we need to wrap this up, we need to recognize our own propensity for division in our own hearts. How easy it is for us to show favoritism towards a certain type of people. How easy it is in every human soul to show uh, to, to live, in fact, for kind of drama in our lives. I, I think about the way we grew up. It's like we didn't know what to do if there was peace in the home. <laughs> the only way we knew how to function is if somebody was fighting, right? So I'll just pick a fight with anybody and try to draw, you know, teams, wherever you could. Some people live like that. A lot of people do, in fact. That this is part of our default nature, is that our propensity to, to not really care about people, to not really be willing to listen and understand the other side of the story. We just are happy with our side. You take yours. How we put people in boxes and caricaturize them. Oh, they're all the same, them so-and-sos. No, they're not. No, they're not. Friends, we need to admit the reality of our own guilty, guiltiness here. 
that at some level we're all dividers. We're all have this propensity for racial, racial uh, hatred and, and all these things. We have to see ourselves as sinners in this and the propensity for sin in our hearts. But here's my question. What stops it? What kills it? What was it that stopped slavery and Hitler in this world? Friends, was it not the fight for people to see that saw the world and reality through God's creation? I'm not saying they were all, they were all Christians. That, that people are equal. That all people deserve dignity in this life. Friends, this is the job of the church to be a demonstration, to be a witness, to be a testimony to these realities. And here's one thing I, I want to remind you of. This, this really came out in my reading this week, that Jesus intentionally pokes the bear in this area of division. Oftentimes in Jesus' stories and parables, guess what he does? Who is the hero? The hero is the Samaritan. That's, those are the bad guys, the unreligious people. The hero is the prostitute. The barbarian or the, the Scythian, right? He uses the people as heroes in, the posi- in a positive way, the people that were outcasts, the people that people thought were on the outside. And the people that thought they were right and on God's path and morally upright were the bad guys. And I think this is, a, it's obviously intentional. And Jesus is trying to make a point for us to humble ourselves. And friends, I love Redeemer. We don't have a lot of racial diversity necessarily in our communities, but we're not afraid of that. But one of the things I love about Redeemer is that there are people from all walks of life going on here. It's a beautiful thing in my opinion, and one of the things I really cherish. But friends, we can't stop at just being content because there is a call upon the church. My question for you is how did all these people get into the church? How did the Jews and the Greeks and the Scythians and the barbarians and the slaves and the free get into the one big building together? Or maybe they met outside. I don't know. But how did they come together? Let me just tell you, there were people like Epaphras that went out and were willing to break down some of those barriers and saw those barriers actually as opportunities to share Jesus Christ with people. And to bring people into the church that they might know Christ. And I just want to challenge you individually to put on this kind of way of seeing people. Not as problems, but as opportunities. Paul saw the world this way when he walked through a town or a village. And he started meeting people. People from all kinds of different walks of life. Listen to what he says. 1 Corinthians 9 19 through 23, for though I am free from all, he could, he didn't have to do, be anything other than who he was, right? But he says, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. He's not thinking in political terms. He's not thinking about medical decisions people make. He's thinking, who can I win to Jesus Christ? This is a Christian way to see people. There are two types of people to Paul. And in reality, those who know Jesus Christ and are going to spend eternity with Christ are those who don't know Jesus Christ or are under God's judgment. Do we really believe this or not? That's the question, and Paul did. And so when Paul walks through, he says, to the Jews, I became a Jew in order to win the Jews. He didn't pretend to be a Jew. He just, he just sat in their context. He, would eat, he wouldn't eat pork. He would obey their rituals and try to get along, you know, and follow the, go with the crowd there. He wasn't sinning. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law, but under the law of Christ, that that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings." Friends, as you walk through this world and we see the division, we see the the polarization of of our world, friends, are we trying to win people to some kind of political agenda or to Jesus Christ? 
I pray that it's to Christ and that you would see people not as problems that you disagree with, but that you would see these people as opportunities that God has placed in your past, that purpose to win them to Jesus Christ. Number two, I got to move on. Put on, number two, the attributes of God. Notice, Paul reminds the people here that they're chosen. That's what it says. He says uh, in, in the verse here, it says, put on then as God's holy chosen ones. Now, you might struggle with that kind of language in the word. It's all over the Bible. We can talk about it on another thing. That's not this topic of the sermon today. But let me just say, this is good news. Because I would never have chosen to follow the path of Christ. Christ has chosen it on my behalf. And what he has chosen for me is to walk in his attributes. These are things that I never would have done had God not chosen this path for us. That's very important. So I want to do a little thing here as we walk through these attributes he lists. I want you to give yourself a little scorecard, one through five, five being good, one being you're really bad. And then we're going to, I want you to keep track of each one of these attributes and maybe give yourself a little score. But I also want you to maybe share it with somebody who knows you really well and deals with you in conflict on a regular basis. You might know somebody like that and see how, what they think about your scorecard. All right, so you're not getting off the hook here. You thought you were just coming to listen to something and, and go home and, and eat a sandwich. No way. This is, we're getting serious. All right. We're putting on the attributes of God. These are attributes that we found in the cross of Jesus Christ. And Paul's saying we're going to put them on. This is what we, this is the good stuff. This is the powered, this is the Holy Spirit driven life, the God empowered life. Number one, compassionate hearts. This is the idea of mercy. And empathy. We see past the offenses and seek to understand hurting people. As we always say, hurt people hurt people, right? Who's going to dig into the hurt? Who's going to look past the offense and get down to what's causing all that? The question here is, are you a good listener? Do people really feel like you care about them or really seeking to understand them? Or are you just kind of listening with one ear? And focusing on something else, somewhere else. Do people really know in conflict with you that you really care and have a compassionate heart towards them? Number two, kindness. The word here is really gentleness. That is, we're not abrasive. We're not rough as we get into conflict. Uh, I mentioned the, the fact that the, in, in my household it was put up or shut up. Whoever could get the roughest wins. Friends, good conflict is gentle. And, and being gentle in conflict does not include these little things, these little passive-aggressive things like eye rolls and little undercutting comments that let the people know that we're really here to fight and we're kind of roughing them up with these things. Do you just want to win? I think this is where this kindness and gentleness, are you really interested in just winning an argument? Or do you really care about how the, how the argument goes? It's not what you say, it's also how you say it. Are you gentle? Number three here, humility. Again, give yourself a score. Share it with me afterwards. Number three, humility. Humility is a deep sense of one's moral littleness. I like that. A kind of self-humiliation. As Brad Bigney famously says, a friend of ours, uh, either humble yourself or you will be humiliated. It's not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less, is the famous quote. In other words, a very necessary component of good conflict, friends, is our willingness to see our own sin first, and as we like to say, our own sin worse. Matthew 7, 3, 5, a very familiar verse for us that Jesus has given us. He says, why do you see the speck in your brother's eyes but don't notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye? When there's a log in your eye, you hypocrite, take the log out of your own eye. And then you'll see clearly. Are you willing to confess your own sin and your own propensities and conflict? Next, meekness. Meekness, as they like to say, is not weakness. Meekness is the willing to suffer injury. I love that. It requires great, greater strength in faith because it, looks, it, it seeks to bring the person that has hurt us or, or injured us into conflict or in confrontation with God and not with me. I want to get out of the way. Your anger, 
and your, your ill will towards me is actually, I want to point them to God. You actually have a God problem, not a Jason problem. And meekness is required for that. A.W. Tozer wrote, The meek man is not a human mouse afflicted with the sense of his own inferiority. Rather, he may be in his moral life as bold as a lion and as strong as Samson. But he has stopped being fooled about himself. I love that. He has accepted God's estimate of his own life. He knows he is as weak and as helpless as God has declared him to be. But paradoxically, he knows at the same time that he is in the sight of God of more importance than angels. In himself, nothing. In God, everything. That is his motto. That's meekness. Patience. Patience is essentially long-suffering. William Barclay like, said about this uh, patience and this word that it's an attitude that never drives us to cynicism or despair towards people. That's tough. Where ill treatment never leads to bitterness or wrath, he said. It's the opposite of resentment and revenge. And friends, where do we find all these things? Do you just conjure these things up? These are the things that we found in our Savior, Jesus Christ, and his attitude towards us. Is it not? Bearing with one another is the next one. We don't give up on people. That's what that means. Yes, we must set boundaries, and we have to have limits. But listen to Paul's attitude about people trying to win people to Christ. We labor, working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and all like scum of the world, the refuse of all things. They were willing to get beat up a little bit spiritually, maybe even physically, in order to win people to Christ. So many times we're so shallow and so wimpy, I might say, that the minute somebody does something wrong to us, we just throw up our hands and say we're done. I get it. Again, we have to have boundaries. We have our own limits. But friends, to win people to Christ, sometimes you're going to have to take a couple on the chin or take one for the team. Finally, forgiving. Paul, and really all these things lead up to an attitude of forgiveness. Paul leads us to forgiving others. As we have experienced the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, he commands us to forgive others. It's a command. Now, I get it. Sometimes it takes time to get there. We want to be patient and gentle and bear with people. But, friends, it's not an option for the Christian. Jesus Christ has forgiven us, and so we must work towards an attitude of forgiving other people in our lives. And why is forgiveness so hard? It's costly, isn't it? We give up on our rights. We give up on keeping them in prison. When I have something against them, I can use it as a weapon and keep them where I want them. But if I turn it over, I re release them. That's really what the word forgiven means. It means to let it go, to, to free it. Tim Keller says, everyone who forgives goes through a death and experiences nails, blood, sweat, and tears. Forgiveness is costly suffering. Forgiveness at first always feels far worse than bitterness. Forgiveness means refusing to make them pay for what they did. However, to refrain from lashing out at someone when you want to do so with all your being is agony. It's a form of suffering. You not only suffer the original loss of happiness, reputation, and opportunity, but now you forego the con consolation of inflicting the same on them. You are absorbing the debt, taking the cost of it completely on yourself instead of taking it out on the other person. It hurts terribly. Many people would say it feels like a kind of death. Outside of the reality that that is exactly what Jesus Christ did for us. And when we forgive somebody, we're really turning that over to Christ. Nobody's getting off the hook for the things that they've done. God is going to deal with them, so I don't need to. So how are you doing? These are the attributes that Paul has called us to put on. They're important. If we're going to be the picture of the church that God has called us to be, friends, there is no place for harboring bitterness and unforgiveness. 
Will you put on the power? This is God-empowered living to put these things on. I would encourage you to meditate through that list and ask God to help you and where you, where you scored low. we got to move on. Number three, put on love. Put on love, he says. Above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. One thing that you need to notice is with the other attributes that he just lifted, put, listed, put on, and then he, he lists out the things that we just went through, those are in a defensive posture. In other words, somebody has done something to me, and I'm responding in a correct attitude. When I want to get angry or mad or show bitterness or lash out, instead I'm going to put on uh, patience and bearing and, and humility and meekness. But love, friends, is an attack. It's not going to wait around for an offense to happen. It recognizes the tension and the potential for conflict. And it's not going to wait around for something, somebody to do something bad. It's going to charge in and press into people's lives. Friends, this is the attitude of our God, uh, the, the God that we know. This is what he has demonstrated in sending a son. That very famous verse, John three sixteen: For God so loved the world... He didn't sit back and say, I love the world. What did he do? He got after it. He didn't wait for us to change our minds. He went in to change our minds for us. And he sent his son into the world. He didn't wait for you to get cleaned up. Praise God for that. Love is an attack. It's a charge. It's not defensive. It's an offensive posture towards the world. This is Holy Spirit-empowered living. This is the good stuff that we say charge towards a lost world like God has demonstrated towards us. God sent, he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And 1 John 4, 19 gives us that same picture. Why do we love? Because Jesus loved first. And can't we say that how are other people going to come to the love, like the love of Christ, because we love them and demonstrated God's love to them? This is the good stuff, friends. And here's my problem with churches growing up, and still to this day, enough hot air. I get so sick of talking. I love doctrine, till the, and I'll talk it till the cows come home. But I am, I am fed up with churches that just talk about doctrine and then aren't doing anything. It just drives me crazy. That want to sit around and talk about how many angels dance on the pin of a needle or something. Or, you know, when, when is this going to happen and all these theological things. Who are you pressing in God's, a person that God has put in your life that God is calling you to press in and love into their lives? Somebody that isn't like you. Somebody that might see things politically different than you. This is what is going to change the world. This is what changed uh, the world that, that the Apostle Paul lived in. They had no money. They had no power. But they charged with waving the banner of love. Did they not? And this is our charge, friends. Nobody is going to get really changed from your social media posts. But they will get chose, changed as you get down in the dirt with people and get involved and show and demonstrate love, not just in acts, but in truth, teaching, teaching, renewing the mind, bringing them to Christ, bringing these things. These things so make sense, but they need to be confronted in love in them. And so, friends, charge. Go. God has put people in your life, annoying people, <laughs> People that are different than you. On purpose, that you might share the gospel, that you might demonstrate the love of Christ that we have known. He didn't wait, he charged in. Body of Christ, charge. Let's pray. Father, help us. These are things, easy things to talk about from a pulpit, they are quite different to do when we look at the condition of the world and, and the overwhelming reality of what we're facing. Praise God there is one power, one power known to man 
the gospel of Jesus Christ that in a moment can change a person completely. Father, we believe in that power. I pray that the people here that are listening, maybe even for the first time, there is a love that's known in Jesus Christ. Although he was God in the flesh, he didn't consider uh, his position as God something to be esteemed or valued. He lowered himself and brought himself into this world and demonstrated love by living a perfect life, showing us the ways of God, demonstrating us, but dying also for helpless sinners like ourselves. And he calls us his friends, and he's given us a way of escape out of this life lost in dark world and eternity with him. But he's also given us the Holy Spirit that we can live and demonstrate and we have purpose and passion in life. Help us, Lord, to live out the gospel-empowered life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.